every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on you the iniquity of us all. Christ the Lord became obedient unto death. Even death on the cross. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We pray you of your mercy, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, look graciously, we pray, on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is from the book of Isaiah. It is the uh, fourth of what are referred to as the servant songs. Uh, today's reading is about the, the sin-bearing servant, the sin-bearing Messiah, and that uh, it foretells the coming of Jesus and uh, his paying for our sins. A, book, a reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, and for that which has not been told them, they shall see, and that which they have not heard, they shall contemplate. Whom has believed what he has heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look upon him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And he by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made the intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple, whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who was this has testified, he who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I have a long list of things I don't like these days. I don't like that my sense of stability and control have been threatened. I don't like to think that life the way I've known it since I was in kindergarten changed drastically 
in the span of about two weeks. I don't like not knowing if life will ever go back to the way things were. I don't like not being able to hug my friends at a time when I need a hug the most. At the start of Lent, the term social distancing was said with a smile and a wink. Now I say it with a bit of anger and sadness at the back of my throat. Wasn't there enough of a distance between us already before all this nonsense began? And I'm not talking about the complaint that we all had about how technology is isolating us. The joke is on us where that's concerned, as we find that technology is our main means these days of making connection. I'm talking about the emotional and spiritual distancing that we can experience. Have you ever felt alone, even in a crowded room? Feeling alone perhaps because you were different, you weren't being understood, or you were in a state of conflict or misunderstanding with someone. And now this. I don't like listening to CBC radio these days. I find it difficult finding a hopeful message in most of the news stories of suffering and death I hear. Although, I must say, a little while ago, there was a doctor being interviewed on CBC, and she said something quite wonderful. She said, the, tone, the term social distancing is not accurate for what we are doing right now. We are practicing physical distancing. And actually, now more than ever, we are in social unity with one another. She went on to give examples of what she had been witnessing in her practice and in her own community. People going out of their way to help their neighbors, donating medical supplies to hospitals and EMS stations. And even more importantly, she described that the reason behind people isolating themselves was mostly out of concern and love and commitment to others. And that, my friends, I found to be good and hopeful in a bad situation. The ultimate story of hope in a bad situation, which we've come together today on this Good Friday to remember, is the story of Jesus' death on the cross. Has anyone ever asked you, why do they call it Good Friday? What's so good about it? Forced isolation directly opposes the human drive to aggregate. That's what a neighbor told me the other day, and I chuckled at his use of the term aggregate because I found it very fitting since he was an engineer. And he used such a utilitarian term to explain the human drive for commingling. Humans have always bonded, banded together since the beginning of time. Perhaps an evolutionary thing, there's safety in numbers, just like animals, better chance of success when you hunt in packs. But the capacity to empathize and to put one's own needs to the side for the well-being of another, I'm not sure if that originates from the same place as does our drive to aggregate. Empathy 
and putting your own needs aside for the sake of others, as the doctor wonderfully described on the radio, is a very religious act. Religious, as defined in the dictionary, a moral code governing the conduct of human affairs, stemming from belief in a superhuman agency. Such religious acts demonstrate that there is a type of love, a type of love that defies the principle of self-preservation and self-promotion. The unselfish religious acts of empathy and compassion that we have been witnessing and participating in for the past few months, I believe, are the direct result of our Lord Jesus Christ's death on a cross. A poor carpenter's son who walked gently upon this earth. His death would change the way humankind viewed one another. Such a good thing. And yet, our revulsion of the cross is universal. Over the centuries, we, the Christ followers, we have come to skirt around the horridness of the cross. We sentimentalize and we glorify the cross, emphasizing the victorious nature of what happened afterwards. The mighty hand of God vanquishing sin and death by raising Jesus to life and proclaiming eternal life for all. Yes, that's what we like. We like to jump to Easter morning celebrations. And we often put aside the first, perhaps the most important, most ugly part of the cross. Because we all have a list of things we don't like. We don't like pain and suffering. We don't like unhappy endings. We don't like being shamed. Most of us don't like change. Unless it was perhaps our own idea and it comes with perceived perks. And we hate feeling isolated from one another and especially from God. And the cross represents all of this. The German Reformed theologian Jürgen Moltmann writes, the cross is not and cannot be loved. I would add, and should not be loved. The gruesomeness of the cross is not so much about how physically painful it was, and not to detract from the physical suffering of Jesus, which was tremendous. A Roman citizen in Jesus' time was not exempt from possible execution, but the execution of a Roman citizen albeit probably excruciatingly painful, was always an honorable one. So death on a cross for a citizen was not an option. Death on a cross, death by crucifixion, always took place outside of the city limits, out on the margins. It was the ultimate degradation, signifying rejection and shame. It was the ultimate shunning. And it was reserved for those who had absolutely no status in society, marginalized, the slaves. So there was a suffering that our Lord experienced that was equally painful 
and that was not experienced by anyone except the least of these, the powerless. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, God lets himself be pushed out of the world on the cross. Jesus' death on the cross was an exercise in real social isolation. And there was yet, there was yet another type of suffering on the cross that deals with isolation. When Jesus cried from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is saying, where is God? There is a godlessness, an isolation from God happening there on the cross. It is relatable, haunting, and terrifying. For the absence of God is the ultimate in suffering. So perhaps this is why we like to dwell more on the upbeat orientation of Christianity. We rush to Easter Sunday, and we like to call ourselves an Easter people. The cross repels us. And if one does not have an understanding of the triune God, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the cross becomes even more problematic when we try to explain it to those who are seeking. Without a clear understanding of the Trinitarian nature of God, without grasping the idea that God is unequivocally made of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, working together in complete agreement in the plan to save humankind. Then the cross presents a huge stumbling block to faith. I've had many people ask me rhetorically, what kind of a monster of a father would hand over his son to such a brutal suffering and death? That kind of God? I do not wish to, indeed I cannot even think of having a relationship with. And my answer to that is, me neither. Remember friends, scripture tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and then the Word dwelt among us in the human form of Jesus. The Father and the Son were in concert by the power of the Holy Spirit. The saving act of relinquishing all one's power and prestige and letting the spirit of fear and self-preservation take the helm. That was a divine united idea that sprung from divine love. The act of letting go and the willingness, indeed the eagerness, to identify with the shamed and the downtrodden, with the weakest that walked on the earth, brought life to all. Jesus Christ's willingness to enter into such a profound isolation brought about a change in the spiritual DNA of all humankind. And we, 2,000 years later, are a part of a long lineage of that new birth. 2,000 years, 2,000 years ago, the self-imposed isolation of one man from his heavenly father created a healing for the nations. Christ's own isolation on the cross continues to breed love and grace and consolation and unity with God. And on this good, good Friday, 
in 2020. We can be sure that our self-imposed physical isolation from one another, while contributing to the healing of the nations, in no way isolates us from the love of God and our neighbor. I'm thinking that our own isolation is breathing new life into the church and what it means to be church. It is Good Friday, and our world is being shaken to the core. And that is okay, because the path to glory passes through real suffering. And there is no way to Pentecost except by Calvary. The Spirit is given from the cross. Jesus asks us to take up our cross and follow him, knowing that Easter is coming, my friends. Easter is coming. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, that all who believe in Him might be delivered from the power of sin and death, and become heirs with Him of eternal life. Let us pray with the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers, and the people whom they serve, for Jenny, our bishop, and for all the people of this diocese, and for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that the Lord will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by your Spirit, the whole people of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your Holy Church, that in our vocation and ministry we may truly and devoutly serve you. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them, for Elizabeth, our Queen, and all the royal family, for Justin, the Prime Minister, and for the government of this country, for Doug, the Premier of this province, and the members of the Legislature, for Patrick, the Mayor of this municipality, and those who serve with him on Brampton Council, for all who serve the common good, that God's help, that they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that justice and peace may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for all who suffer persecution or prejudice, for the sick, the wounded, and the handicapped, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love, and stir up in us the will and the patience to minister to their needs.
Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow and the strength of all who suffer. Hear the cries of those in misery and need. In their afflictions, show them your mercy. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them. For the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for all who have not heard the words of salvation, for all who have lost their faith, for all whose sin has made them indifferent to Christ, for all who actively oppose Christ by word or deed, for all who are enemies of the cross of Christ and the persecutors of his disciples, for all who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not yet heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock and one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life, and that with all who have departed this life and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, that we may be accounted worthy to enter the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life on the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and the things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. But you 
have prepared a cross for your Saviour.
tongue condemn with persecution and mass murder. I made you joint heirs with them of my covenants, but you made them spit goods for your own guilt. Oh.
was strong enough to come and fight for me, to go through hell and down into the grave, and raise me up to see you face to face, and raise me up to see Let us pray. Holy God, our Son, Jesus Christ, carried our sins in his own body on the tree, so that we might have life. May we and all who remember this day find new life in him, now and in the world to come, where he lives with you and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead. To your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Send down your abundant blessing, Lord, upon your people who have devoutly recalled the death of your Son, ensure a certain hope of the resurrection. Grant them pardon. Bring them comfort. May their faith grow stronger, and their eternal salvation be assured. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.